Um, it's really a great pleasure. You don't know what a great pleasure it is to be here and uh, to have this conversation with you. And um, in fact, David uh, probably doesn't know how much, how hard I wanted to be here. And I'll let you know how hard I wanted to be here. I got his invitation only a few days ago, I have to, I have to confess. And I was in Sydney after a conference and thinking I was going to take a few days off. Little did I know. So Friday I was in Sydney, Saturday I was in Hong Kong, Sunday I was in Paris, Monday I was in the UK, spent the day in the UK, Tuesday I flew to Boston, and yesterday I came here. So this is how hard I wanted to be with you today. Little did I know that the last stretch was going to be so hard because yesterday um, the President of the United States decided to go to Chicago at the same time as I was going there, which closed the airfield, of course, and we were in a holding pattern for long enough that we needed to go to Grand Rapids to refuel. So I almost gave this talk from Michigan. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very pleased. As you can see, I'm very pleased to be here. So um, this presentation will be a little bit... Um, high level, I, I, I suppose, to give you an overview of some of the work that we're doing with collaborators. Uh, the subject, the application area, biomolecular electrostatics, is not my area of expertise, so forgive me. I know that there are some people here in, that are experts in molecular dynamics. If I say anything that is terribly wrong, uh, it's uh, because, obviously, I don't know. <laughs> so I do have some collaborators that help me to get out of trouble, and I ran the slides through uh, him last night at midnight, for which he was not very happy. So uh, the remaining mistakes, of course, are still my, still my responsibility. So this is how I called it, multiplying speedups, fast algorithms on GPUs. And so the idea is, uh, in these applications that are a little bit more uh, complex, we want to have the opportunity to uh, not only use the hardware acceler acceleration, but also use fast algorithms, and so get uh, an effect, a multiplicative effect through that. So two little motivations short to start with. The first idea that I want to uh, propose to you is that the GPU easy pickings, I call them, are really running out. What do I mean by that? For example, so since the GPU uh, wave of enthusiasm on the last few years, there have been sort of um, uh, a bunch of very fast su success, success stories with um, algorithms that are, uh, of course, well suited for the uh, massively parallel architecture. One of them is molecular dynamics. And we saw all of these speed ups of 100 fold, and people were very, very enthusiastic about this. But it's uh, usually because the algorithms were m massively parallel themselves, and they were then well suited to take advantage of the architecture. Now, um, I picked up this quote that I like very much uh, from uh, this book, Numerical Linear Algebra, of uh, Professor Nick Trafford in, in Oxford and Professor Bao. And uh, I, like it, I like this idea that, you know, <laughs> the faster the computer, the more important it is that we have uh, efficient algorithms. And this is one of the motivations of this talk. The easy pickings are those uh, algorithms that are embarrassingly par parallel. We've done those. I mean, not, or not we, as in me, but most of you. <laughs> and so now um, m many of the challenging applications that remain will require that we use some more involved algorithms, which mean that we have to now work a little harder to get these algorithms to work um, um, and accelerate with the new hardware. So that's the first motivation. The second motivation is this idea that algorithms uh, are able to give us as much or more speed up than Moore's law. So this is one example. Here is a, a plot that appeared in this report from the DOE called A Science-Based Case for Large-Scale Simulation, also known as the Scales Report. The first volume in 2003, they presented uh, this plot which shows a span of 40 years. And on the red line, you see the speed up that was obtained by successive um, 
changes in both the mathematical, no, in this case, not in the mathematical formulation, but just the algorithms. So successive improvements in the algorithms. This is for the application here was, um, it's like a Laplace kernel, and say it was a fixed problem size of, I think, 64 cube or something like that. I'm afraid I don't uh, have my presenter notes in the background, uh, which would have told me that uh, exact number. <laughs> And uh, you can see that in the span of 40 years, the acceleration that was obtained by just the improvements in algorithms is equal, in this case, to what would have been obtained by Moore's law. Now, Moore's law was happening at the same time, and the algorithms produced, in this case, in the 40 years, I think, a million-fold increase in speed. And so, if you add them all together, rather multiply them both, both together, you get much uh, much, much more increases in performance. So this is um, one example. Here's another example which is applied, and uh, don't, uh, don't be concerned about the details of this plot because it applies to uh, an application uh, which I, I don't know the details either, but I just want you to concentrate on the, uh, the lines here, the red and the green and the blue. The blue one indicates the speed up that would come from Moore's law alone. And the application is plasma fusion and um, magnetohydrodynamic simulations. And the uh, performance is measured in what is called the effective sustained speed, which um, uh, is uh, equivalent to the gigaflops performance. And you see this, uh, you, he you see here that there's these jumps that happen, right? Uh, every certain number of years. These jumps are due to uh, an improvement in either the methods of solving the problem or the algorithms. And you can see that there's this, um, in, um, these, these improvements in performance that happen every number of years, which can surpass the improvements that we see from hardware alone. So this is another example of the importance of algorithms and um, in comparison to just Moore's law, without even going into uh, GPU and such. The final one, I hope you can see this a little bit, uh, those lines are a little bit thin, but you can see for this case, this is combustion simulations, and it also appears in the scales report. By the way, these reports are all available online, you can find them, and um, Department of Energy, and uh, this is the second volume, 2005, and you can see for this combustion problem as well, the same sort of pattern, which is, of course, more slow and inexorably is, um, uh, you know, going up or uh, doubling every 18 months or, or whatever it is. And uh, at, at the same time, you see this pattern of jumps every number of years, which are produced by either reformulations, in this case, some reformulations of the mathematics of the problem, or improvements in the algorithms themselves. Now. When the algorithms, the improvements in the algorithms result in a change on the scaling, for example, going from, say, an uh, order and cube algorithm to an order and log n algorithm, the gap, between, the gap between the old and the new algorithm is going to get bigger and bigger as we go to larger problem sizes, as we solve harder and harder problems. And so uh, these things compound in the end to give us greater cap capability. So that's my, my second motivation. And so let me now go on to um, the, the, the idea of computational biology and uh, what's the vision in this effort that we've started. Now, my area of expertise, I'm originally a me mechanical engineer. That's my, my undergraduate is in mechanical engineering. And my PhD is in aeronautics. And I'm a computational fluid dynamicist. And so this is a new field for me. I, uh, um, put some things together here to describe the field, thinking that we'd have a very diverse audience, audience and some people would benefit from this. But for the experts in the audience, please forgive me that uh, it's not my area of expertise. But um, I collaborate with a group of people like we do in computational science, where we bring together the expertise in algorithms and, um, and, and certain computational approaches. And we have uh, other people that are experts in the applications, and we work together. So this is. This is how we do things in computational science. So I want to start with this idea that, well, electrostatics is important, basically. Uh, it's this important 
so, so important that almost all biological processes, according to someone who is an expert, uh, and here's the, <laughs> here is the, uh, the quote, and uh, I just was talking earlier with um, uh, when May and with David, I'm going to prepare a little list of references and put them on the Google Groups for you for, for, so that you can uh, find these, these, some of these resources that I've used to prepare this presentation. So he says that almost all biological process, processes are either controlled or modulated by electrostatic effects. So electrostatics is very important in biological processes. So uh, a very high level description of why it's important. The calculation of electrostatic energies uh, is well recognized as a very effective tool to determine the correlation between structure and function. So by structure, so and this is a very old idea, an idea that uh, come, goes back to the, to the 18, to 1894, uh, uh, Emil Fischer's idea that an enzyme and a substrate are like lock and key. The lock and key analogy refers to the fact that the shape, this geometry, uh, is determining the function. This is the idea. And electrostatic energies are a tool to observe that uh, through physics, which is great. You know, we can observe, we apply physics and chemistry to study biology. So first, structure. What do we mean by structure? There's actually a journal called structure. So this is a very, very broad field. What we mean by that is that the conformations, the geometry, the three-dimensional shape of these things that are called uh, macromolecules or proteins and so on. And this is also quite old. In 1959, we have the first X-ray structures. And at that time, uh, people thought, gee, we're in good um, shape to solve this problem. And um, in 1965, already the structure of an enzyme substrate complex was, was observed and described. I do have uh, some uh, more details about these references for those of you interested, and I will add them in the notes. And uh, so it seemed like everything was going well. Today, we have the Protein Data Bank, which is a worldwide repository of enormous quantities of um, data sets for proteins, for, for, for the, for the um, geometry of the proteins, their structure. But even so, uh, 20 years later from those, uh, well, 40 years later, <laughs> uh, we uh, still have this challenge, the challenge of providing a reliable correlation between the X-ray structures and the biological action of the molecules. This is an ongoing challenge. So structure refers to the shape. And what are the functions? So we're talking about structure, function, correlation. Now we, we can imagine that structure, what, what structure means is the shape of the key and the lock that match together. And the function is opening um, the, the door to the secrets of biology. For example, these are just some examples. There's many, many more uh, things that one could mention here, but just some examples. One process is electron, tr electron transfer reactions, and these are involved in key energy transaction process processes, change of energy from one form to another. For example, photosynthesis. So quite an important thing to try to understand, quite an important thing to perhaps try to mimic in technology opening the door perhaps to new forms of energy if we were able to really comprehend such a process. The binding of ligands and proteins, another process which is extremely important and involved in the structure-based drug design. I stole a slide there from a professor in Stanford just to give you some eye candy here indicating that drugs are designed to fit in a certain little shape that is ideal for um, a little space in the three-dimensional conformation of the molecule where the drug just fits right and is like lock and key. It produces some sort of function. Number three, enzyme catalysis. Now what an important process. It's involved in all chemistry of life. If there were no enzymes, there wouldn't be life. Because the chemistry that is involved in life, um, you know, the, the, some of that chemistry would take thousands more time to happen if it wasn't for the presence of enzymes. 
And it all is also behind much of biotechnology interests of today. For example, the production of biofuels and things like that. So hugely important field. And finally, protein fold folding and stability. Why, why is that 